Uh, hello from Copenhagen, where we are a team from the Secretariat mm -hmm. working to ensure that this meeting goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, my name is Andreas Baker. I've been asked to facilitate uh, this meeting, but of course, it's a group effort here uh, putting this all together. Uh, before passing the floor to the chair of the committee, uh, I'd just like to make some technical announcements, please. Uh, please note that the meeting is being recorded and broadcast live on the OCPA social media platforms and websites. There is interpretation available in the, the OSC six official languages on the Zoom function. If you look for the little globe at the bottom, you can find it there. So you can choose whichever language is most convenient. Um, the secretary has already registered more than 25 people signed up for the speakers list. Uh, so we'll of course be starting with that. However, I expect to, that there might be some time ad for additional speakers that may wish to, to join. So if, you, if that's the case, if you have not already registered in the speakers list, Please do so in the, the Zoom chat function. Um, my colleagues will be posting the list on an ongoing basis so that everybody's a bit, uh, aware of, of what's coming up. Um, due to the high interest, uh, we, will, we expect to request speakers to keep their, their remarks to within three minutes, uh, if possible. And finally, uh, please turn on your video only when given the floor. It helps to, to ensure the stability of the connection. Um, so keep your camera off unless you're actually making an intervention. Uh, with that, I ask the uh, chair of the committee, Mr. Kiriakos Hajiani, to please uh, start the meeting. Thank you, Andreas. Colleagues, uh, colleagues, I'm pleased to welcome you to this meeting of the General Committee on Democracy, Human Rights and Humanitarian Question. This is an historic moment as the beginning of the, of the OSCEPA's first ever remote session. I am sure we all hope it will be the last time that we are forced to meet remotely. As you have seen, the agenda for our meeting has been circulated in accordance with the special emergency rules adopted by the standing committee. Our meeting will consist mainly on consideration of the report by our rapporteur and debate. I hope we can agree on this as a basis for our meeting Thank you. You have already some technical information from Andreas Becker, from the Secretariat. I have also asked Andreas to function as facilitator for the debate part of our meeting. This is the best way to assure a smooth procedure under these technical circumstances. With that, uh, I will move to agenda item number two, but allow me to inform the meeting that uh, uh, I want to inform the committee that our vice president, Michael Link, is in the hospital with his father, who is in a difficult situation. We, uh, we wish him the best and a good recovery. So let's move to item number two of the agenda. Friends, it is a pleasure to see you again, or at least to almost see you. I will not take too much time in my report. However, I would like to inform you of some of the work that I and colleagues have been doing on your behalf since we last convened in February. I would also like to thank all the members of this committee for, the continuing, for their continued interest and response to the events organized by the third committee. At our last committee meeting, we had an excellent debate focused on the impact of COVID on democracy and elections. We have all became used to the daily tragedies and complications caused by the pandemic, but the societal consequences are also significant. Our discussion, informed particularly by reports from recent election observation missions was quite telling and I hope useful for all. If I may try to sum up in one phrase what I took away from the discussion, I would say that COVID profoundly impacts our democratic functioning, but doesn't necessarily impede it. Impede it. This, the distinction between these two comes from the political will to overcome the challenges. Since February, I have continued to work closely with Michael Link and Kari Herrickson 
on behalf of this committee. I was to, to extend my very sincere thanks to both of them for the excellent cooperation and support. I would also like to emphasize that in the third committee bureau, we decided to work collectively, setting solidarity and consent as priorities with the only criterion being the right work. That was the modus operandi as the third committee. All decisions were collectively taken. The previous experience of both Michael and Gary contributed to and enrich the work of our committee. Michael's previous experience in ODIR was a key factor in our work in the third committee as it helped to highlight the need for building up stronger synergies between ODIR and national parliament. I suggest that this cooperation continues. The national delegations can play a central role in this development. I was particularly pleased that we were able to convene a webinar focused on humanitarian protection and human rights in conflict zones. As you may know, this is a topic that I have long focused on. Prior to the pandemic outbreak, our committee had conducted a number of fact-finding missions in conflict zones. Unfortunately, our planning for further visits has been deferred due to the pandemic. It will not come as a surprise to anybody that this was a, sensi a sensitive discussion, but I think that we demonstrated that a thorough treatment of the topic, keeping a humanitarian focus in mind, is constructive and necessary. We must seek humanitarian protection as a separate matter from political difficulties that continue to hinder the resolution of many protract protracted conflicts. Many of you probably also turned in for our webinar on health as a human right. Our high level guest speakers brought some significant clarity to the challenges to realizing real universal health coverage. I, go, I will not pretend that this is easy, but the devastation caused by the past years health crisis makes it very clear that this should remain high on our agenda. Failures of a health system cause insecurity and should be on the OSCE agenda. I personally believe that more attention needs to be paid to the right to health care because of its crucial role to the concept of comprehensive security. While travel to trouble spots has obviously not been an option, together with Michael Ling and Kari Herrickson, I have continued to bring attention to human rights problems as they have occurred. On many occasions, our statements and communications have been done jointly. I think this is a strong sign on behalf of the committee, and I thank them both for their cooperation. We have unfortunately had to issue statements of concern on several occasions related, for example, to the situation in Belarus, as well as about developments in other countries, both East and West of Vienna. We always seek to maintain an open dialogue on the human rights principles of this organization, and I hope we can address any further questions in our meeting today. I do not want to take more of our limited time so I will move now to agenda item three. We have all had a chance to read the report by our rapporteur, Vice President Kari Herringsen. On behalf of, of the committee, I would like to thank Kari for her hard work in putting together an excellent report that I think touches upon the main human rights issues facing our region today. And if I may add a personal comment, I think that the report very well demonstrates that there is work for all of us to do. Kari has demonstrated very clearly that protected human rights is not only for other countries to focus on, but that all of us also in our home parliaments 
must dedicate attention to. None of us are beyond reproach. As previously mentioned, we are working under emergency rules for this remote session. As such, we will not be voting on this report. We will therefore, in good parliamentary tradition, focus today on debating the critical human rights topics facing all of us. To start, to start off our discussion, I invite Rapporteur Kari Kerikson to please give us an overview of the, of the priorities and main messages in, in her report. Based on, on this, I am sure we will have a useful discussion. You have the floor, Kari, and I ask you please to keep your comments within some 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. Kari, you have the floor. Thank you very much and thank you also for your leadership in the committee and also to Michael for the good cooperation we have had. And I would also like to thank the opportunity to think, th thank all of you for your dedication and interest in participating in our web seminars, which has been really good. And to start with, I um, want to thank you all for connecting also today. It's a pleasure for me to present my report to this committee. In preparing this, I have worked within the overall theme of the annual session on reinforcing multilateralism in the times of global crisis, a parliamentary call for future action. It has been two years since the last 2019 annual session in person in Luxembourg. The situation described in the report I present today differs significantly from them, although there are also some similar themes. Let me discuss some of the major issues and key recommendations I propose in the report. This year, it is of course not possible to avoid mentioning the unprecedented circumstances as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It affected each of us in our reg regular activities. It impacted detrimentally on democracies and human rights, and it accelerated existing structural inequalities. In my report, I have particularly worked to shed light first on the state of multilateral discussions on human rights topics, second, on concerns related to intolerance and discrimination, Third, on the role of health and well-being in contributing to enjoyment of human, human rights. And fourth, on continued concerns related to insufficient respect for basic freedoms. In many OSCE countries, we have noted increases in authoritarianism, massive restrictions on freedom of the media, attacks on journalists, surging domestic violence cases, and a virtual pandemic of hate speech towards minorities, refugees and migrants, and other people made vulnerable. I am very concerned with the rise of extremism and terrorist actions in places as diverse as Germany, Turkey and Canada. Similarly, it is becoming more and more evident that the shrinking space of civil society and the free media, for instance in Belarus and Russia, Moreover, I want to draw attention and reiterate my concern over the consequences of the unsolved conflicts in the OSCE region. Even while addressing other issues, we must work to address the massive humanitarian impact of the illegally annexed Crimea and the conflict in and around Ukraine and of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We see from other areas, such as in Georgia, that the humanitarian impact continues even long after the guns have fallen silent. To this end, I urge parliamentarians to demand that their governments find the political will to mutually beneficial resolutions for the conflicts. In OSCE, as the world's largest security organization, can play a critical role in a renewed focus on human-centered conflict resolutions in a post-COVID area. I believe that through constructive dialogue, we can achieve tangible results. 
Most of the issues I mentioned will not come as a surprise for you. But with this report, I would like to raise awareness about these serious developments and call on parliamentarians to engage in actions by providing a set of recommendations. Most of the issues I discuss in the report require multilateral efforts, and so it is in our hands to work in a collaborative approach in the interest of our elaborate, electorate. Dear colleagues, multilateral diplomacy in the post-COVID-19 period will be vital for reviving faith in institutions. Unilateral approaches are often easier than the short term, but they fail to provide sustainable solutions. We must reinforce dialogue, even in online format, centered around delivery of humanitarian goals and communities' interests, if we want lasting fixes. We can benefit from each other's experiences and advice through the OSCE PA platform. But I would also encourage all parliamentarians to utilize the other tools that the OSCE has at its disposal. We can all make use of the expert leg legislative Slative review through the ODIR and benefit from recommendations by the ODIR's High Commissioner on National Minorities and the Representative of Freedom of the Media. Just like the OSCE field missions where they exist, these are resources that can help us deliver on the expectations on, of our populations and we should make use of them. My report also highlights the need for concerned efforts to overcome pandemic of abuse and intolerance that has plagued our societies before and particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, it has become evident that social and economic changes are particularly impactful on people made vulnerable. This includes women and girls, children, national, sexual and religious minorities, including Roma and Sinti. It includes migrants, refugees, and internally displaced persons, people with disabilities, older persons, children, uh, uh, refugees, and um, I'm sorry, people with disabilities, older persons, incarcerated persons, as well as people in conflict impacted zones. The report about the violations of these rights of each of these groups are truly disturbing. We must take seriously our responsibilities to, to support the most vulnerable in our societies. Looking at the particular cha challenge of migrants, I also call for the OSCE to appoint a senior official similar to the High Commissioner on National Minorities, focused on protecting migrants and supporting OSCE countries' engagement along all steps of the migration path. Needless to say, our work in this field should really should rely on evidence-based data and research findings. Collection of sex disaggregated data is an essential tool for the design and implementation of gender-relevant policies, which consider the needs of every social, ethnic, and minority group. I would like to highlight that women's ec economic empowerment and associated structural changes are prerequisites for sustainable de development and for creating a genuinely equal society in the long term. Regrettably, basic rights to health and well-being has been seriously undermined over the past year. The inequalities of access to health played out across our television screens as hospitals and even football stadiums filled up with patients. Of course, we also know that this often takes place not shown in the news in which people have suffered even more of the lack of healthcare. OSCE countries must reaffirm both in principle and in practice that, that healthcare and vaccination should be accessible on equal and non-discriminatory basis. I urge parliamentarians to actively oversee the implementation of such measures. I would like to underscore that limited access to healthcare services pose that threat to human security and stability. I consider that important of the OSCE to work on identification of health access imbalances and early warning mechanisms throughout the region. It is extremely troubling to note that more than 1.6 billion children 
of, of and youth were affected by major school closures during the pandemic. We need to crowd-focus support in overcoming the difficulties of self-isolation and facilitating distant learning to ensure that the impact of this pandemic is not longer lasting than it must be. Governments should immediately prioritize the swift inclusion of young graduates in labor markets to avoid long-term negative consequences. Dear colleague, we must unfortunately also acknowledge that enjoyment of fundamental freedoms is under threat in many places throughout the OSCE. We all know that there have been some restrictions on regular life during the past year. This is understandable, but only to a degree. There are some limitations on assembly may be understandable under pandemic conditions. It is very clear that the COVID-19 measures were used as a pretext by some governments to unnecessarily limit the freedom of peaceful assembly. Also, there can be no reason for restriction freedom of expression under these circumstances. I acknowledge, of course, that issues related to freedom of expression are not necessarily simple, particularly as technology develops rapidly. This is uh, true when it comes to political sensitive periods. To this end, I urge, I suggest that ODIA, in coordination with the OSCE media representative, consider preparing guidelines and advice to participating states on the use of regulation on social media, particularly in the context of elections. From an OSCE perspective, there are several issues that I think need more attention from all of us. I can, uh, I can assure you it is crucial to listen to the voices of the NGO, who brings expertise and insight to the OSCE work. The same is true at home in each of our parliaments. To ensure effective parliamentarian work, we should all seek to eff effectively benefit from the expert input of civil society organizations, in particular those working directly with vulnerable groups. Dear colleagues, while our focus has been understandably on the pandemic this year, many other topics are in the need of our attention. Given this, that this year we will not vote on a resolution, I would like to reiterate that the report provides a list of recommendations, many stemming from your input during OSCE PA web dialogues that can be in, of use for us and the governments. I would encourage all OSCE PA members to refer to them for drafting better and informed policies. I also hope and suggest that the OSCE PA increase its interaction through web dialogues and pressing on pressing issues can be continued. These have been useful, useful policy exchanges, enabling us to stay on top of important topics in our region and engaging with various experts. To return to a new, new reality requires informed and inclusive policymaking. The post-pandemic wor world is in the hands of us parliamentarians. And it is we who should take responsibility to, and to act to build a better future. I look forward to a fruitful discussion that we all can benefit from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kari, dear Kari. We now have time for discussion on the presentation by our rapporteur. Due to our time constraints, I have set a speaking time of three minutes, which will hopefully enable everybody to intervene and have their input here. Please pay attention to the clock on screen. I will ask Andreas Baker to please facilitate this discussion. Andreas, please call our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would also note, in addition to the clock that will be showing up on the screen in the moment, I'm going to be using some very high technology to keep us all on track. Chair, I would also note, in addition to the So you'll be hearing that occasionally if you go over time. Uh, to start off, I will call uh, Ms. Farah Karimi from the Netherlands, followed by Maka Bocorishvili from Georgia. Ms. Farimi, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, dear reporter, Kari Hendrickson. First of all, thanks to the reporter for her excellent report. I fully underline her worries about the human rights situation currently in OSCE region. 
As mentioned in the report, we see an increase in authoritarianism, massive restrictions on freedom of speech and demonstrations, attacks on journalists, lack of access to information and justice, and so on. The rapporteur mentioned several specific cases in the OSCE region. I would like to put emphasis on the current situation in Belarus. It is shortly mentioned in the report, referring to the shrinking space for civil society and for media, affecting civilians and their rights to peaceful gatherings and demonstrations, including arbitrary arrest and detention and torture. I am very worried about the ongoing suppression of dissent in Belarus. The chair, vice chair, and reporter of this committee issued several statements about, about it last week. And also yesterday, they welcomed the transfer to house arrest of Roman Protasevich and Sofia Sepaga and urged for the release of political prisoners. I welcome this very much and would like to continue in their line. The human rights situation continues to deteriorate in Belarus. Many journalists and persons expressing their opinion are in prison under worrying conditions. Health workers who participated in demonstrations were faced with reprise, uh, reprisals from the authorities. Amnesty International fears for life of Victor Paulau. He may have been executed. His sister has been denied permission to visit him on 10th of June, and his lawyer was told that he was no longer in the detention center. Belarus remains the only country in the whole of Europe and the former Soviet Union which still implements death sentences. According to Amnesty International, in Belarus, death sentences are often impo uh, imposed after unfair trial. As said by Svetlana, Sikanoskaya, people are scared, no one feels safe, and the borders are closed too, so there is no escape. End of quotation. For this reason, to support the population of Belarus and to pay attention to their situation, I would like to submit a draft urgency item on the situation in Belarus to the Standing Committee next week. It calls on the Belarusian authorities to rethink their general approach to dissent in the country and to release all political prisoners. I call on you to support this item, which has been distributed to all secretaries of delegations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Farimi. I now call uh, Maka Potrodoshvili, followed by Gwen Moore. Ms. Potrodoshvili, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let me start by thanking Rapporteur Carrie Hendrickson for her report, uh, gathering uh, crucial messages and recommendations. As the members of Parliament equipped with the mandate from people, we have an enormous obligation to use this format to shape better post-pandemic world and to pay a pivotal role to in protection human rights. Well, the COVID pandemic has complicated and created new challenges that need to be addressed through the development of common approaches and working mechanisms, having a significant impact on the already fragile state of multilateralism. The pandemic has further deepened mistrust and polarization. We should use this crisis by taking a lesson and building more resilient and inclusive systems. To this end, international cooperation is perhaps more relevant than ever, and since no country is immune to the global challenges or able to scrap health social economic crisis by its own means. There could be an inclination to use COVID pandemic as a justification to abandon one commitments, one's commitments under international law or Helsinki final act. For that, we need to be uh, united and vocal to defend the rule-based international order. USC, with its multidimensional approach to security, is well suited to contribute to the protection of human rights globally, and we, the members of parliament, have a special stake to embolden our national policies to this end. 
Well, OSC countries have all committed to promoting and protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms in fair and equitable manner. We would no, we should not forget that today Georgia is facing the Russian aggression and its harsh consequences. As noted in the recent judgment of European Convention on Human Rights in the case of Georgia versus Russia, Russia, uh, Russian Federation continues to exercise effective control over Georgian regions, Abkhazia and Tsinwali region. Moreover, Russian Federation is now fulfilling, is not fulfilling its international obligations. Inter alia, the ceasefire agreement of 12th August 2008 and to withdraw its forces from Georgian territories. Amid the COVID-19 crisis, the Russian military presence and pressure is growing with the so-called borderization process and constant violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms. As a continuation of its destructive action, the occupation regime uses the kidnappings and illegal detentions, seriously destabilizing the situation on the ground. To name the few, Zaza Kaheladze, a citizen of Georgia, has been shot and wounded during his illegal detention by the occupation forces for almost a year ago, despite numerous calls of the international community to immediately release uh, Zaza Kaheladze and other Georgian citizens, they are still in custody. We once again appeal to international partners to give a due assessment to yet another provocation by Russian occupation regime and take effective measures to ensure immediate release of illegally detained Georgian citizens. Moreover, the epidemiological situation in the occupied regions remain dire, especially taking into account poor quality of medical services on the ground. Unprecedentedly uh, lengthy closure of so-called crossing points and continuous restriction of movement of, uh, of movement have extremely aggravated the humanitarian situation on conflict affected peoples. In April, for example, fourth residents of Kali district in occupied Abkhazia region died while trying to cross Senguri to Georgian government controlled territory while trying to access the proper healthcare services. From the very first day- Please conclude now. Yeah, I'm concluding. This is, uh, we all need to understand that OSC Parliamentary Assembly is a platform through which a common will and approaches must be found to address these issues in a timely and effective manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. I then pass the floor to Representative Gwen Moore, followed by Vice President Margarete Sederfeld. Ms. Moore, please. Thank you so much. And just let me uh, start by uh, talking about the tremendous work that our rapporteur, uh, uh, Carrie Hendrickson, has done. Uh, the, the draft report notes that all that notes the Declaration of Human Rights, where everyone uh, deserves. Uh, health care and to live and be healthy. And I think the tragedy of this uh, pandemic, uh, not just that it's been a pandemic, but the tragedy has been that some uh, countries uh, have used the pretext of the pandemic to restrict human rights uh, and to impose uh, restrictions on certain communities. Um, in the United States, we saw the unfortunate targeting of Asian people um, being blamed for the pandemic and being treated violently uh, and in the rise of hate crimes. Um, uh, but we also saw our ability to crush the virus stymied by people's unfounded fears of, of oppression. Uh, we had a big uh, war around whether or not to, to wear masks to protect each other. And I think a lot of that uncertainty uh, was built into maybe some of the things, the, the fear of repression. Uh, and so if we're going to kill the virus uh, globally, I think it's really important to reconcile um, these human rights violations with the real concern uh, and safety for public health. 
you know, what we tried to do in the United States was to reach out and provide monetary supports to businesses and to individuals and people with children and to try to come up with, um, uh, with trusted uh, people to encourage people to get the vaccination uh, and to use science and data. And I think that uh, as one of our former presidents said, uh, that the biggest fear is fear itself. And so I, uh, again, I wanna congratulate this committee uh, on this, uh, this important work and join, uh, add my voice to the voice of those who believe that oppression is no place for providing good public health. And I would yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Moore. I will then pass the floor to uh, Vice President Margarete Sederfeld to be followed by Hedy Fry from Canada. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Chair, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the floor. Human rights is one of the main pillars of the OSCE commitments that all member countries have signed up to, to implement, respect and follow. As the rapporteur have stated today, in a report, the world faces huge challenges. And when it comes to security, democracy and human rights, the pandemic have affected all of us. In the pathway of the pandemic, can we see how the lockdown world, worldwide ha have had negative effect of fundamental freedoms? In several countries have the government strengthen their power on behalf of the parliament and by this, by the people. It's important that we as parliamentarians fight and continue to support democracy, to support each other, to get the power back to the parliament, to the people. And on the, we have to do this both on the national level, on international level, in organizations like OSCEPA and we have to support multilateralism. What I also would like to conclude with is the development in today's Russia when it comes to democracy. The leading opposition figure, Mr. Alexei Navalny, was first poisoned, then he's jailed. Just as well as other polit political figures in opposition. There is an upcoming election in Russia to the Duma in September. And by this, I mean, democracy is important. We have to support democracy. We have to stand up, even when it's negative, when it's struggle. I say this as uh, I present the report 2020 done by, on behalf of OSEPA on the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. In the report, did I point out some recommendations? One of them was the implementation of Magnitsky laws. There are some countries who have implemented Magnitsky laws. Also in the European Union, do we have the Magnitsky laws? But I would really support and hope that there will be more countries who could implement them. I did also propose increased level of transparency when it comes to the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. But I would like to say that is this, it's still uh, required when it comes to the, uh, uh, to the situation with uh, uh, Alexei Navalny, because there is no, still no transparency. Russia have laws. They have uh, also a judicial system but it's not implemented. And I do really hope that we as a parliamentary organization can support democracy and respect of human rights in Russia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I will then pass the floor to Dr. Hedy Fry to be followed by Annie Samsonian. Dr. Fry, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to first and foremost congratulate the dynamic team of uh, 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 u
tan Michael, dinámico. El señor Keriako. Somebody is. Cyprus. One, I can hear the yeah. interpreter. Yes. Okay, please, please try and go ahead again, Dr. Fry. All right. Uh, I can begin. I think it was the interpreter whose voice, is, voice was overlining everything. I wanted to say I want to congratulate the dynamic team of Kyriakos, uh, uh, Michael Link, and of course the excellent report by Kerry Henriksen. I think you have done great work uh, handing down from Kyriakos doing this for over the years pointing out things that needed to be pointing out and speaking boldly. I want to congratulate you all for speaking boldly on the things that are wrong with the OSCE region right now that we need to work hard to recommend. But I, I, I know you always expect me to talk about gender, I will, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about healthcare. The pandemic has exposed the fact that, that Women, especially, uh, were at the forefront, both as health workers and secondly, as, uh, as, as caregivers in many instances, and therefore at great risk. Uh, and yet many of them did not, in many of our OSC regions, have access to health care. Health care is a human right. And the idea that in some countries there isn't universal health care is actually something we need to do something about. In Canada, we have access to health care regardless of where you live, regardless of your ability to pay, regardless of your ethnicity, your race, regardless of whether you are a refugee or an immigrant, everyone has equal access to health care. Uh, and, and so this is something we should aim for in the whole of the region. I just wanted to say that, that there are some people, not just women who have shown to be at risk for health care, but we've also noted that many people who are minorities, as Carrie pointed out, are in fact at risk of not having access to health care. Many of the OSC regional countries are too poor to be able to afford the infrastructure to be able to give that health care. And as we see migrants crossing the whole of the OSC region, many of them have absolutely no access to health care whatsoever. And the, the, where women come in is it nearly always uh, women are the ones who have no access when they're pregnant, have no access to reproductive health and rights. Uh, and, and these are the things that we need to fight for and to ensure that they are universal across our system. But I think remembering the most important thing, the face of poverty is a female face. And when women who are poor don't have the education, housing, food and the lack of the things that are needed to keep them healthy, then I think we need to really look at that gendered face of lack of access to health care. And we all need to work very clearly to ensure that health care becomes a human right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fry. I uh, then pass the floor to Annie Samsonian from Armenia to be followed by Steve Motled from Norway, please. Samsonian. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, Ms. Harrison. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to you for preparing a report on human rights in this difficult condition of the world's pandemic situation and presenting it to the OECPA. I expected to see mentions in this report about Armenian prisoners, war and captives, about tortures, because it is a, this is an issue of fundamental human rights. Unfortunately, dear colleagues, I have to speak out once again about the fact that Azerbaijan continues to violate this principle, does not return Armenian prisoners of war, civilian captives, including women. These days, trials have begun in Azerbaijan against Armenian captives, which completely violate the principles of international law, the right of captives and their families. The issue of humanitarian law is politicized by Azerbaijan. I will post a link in the conversation chat and show you Voy a colgar un enlace en el chat de la conversación y así lo veré. Where the presidents of Azerbaijan and Turkey were talking la about de Azerbaijan, los presidentes de Azerbaijan y Turquía. Prisoners of war as a subject of Sorry, uh, just one moment I'm sorry, sorry, what, we're, what we're having the... some interruption with the interpreter's line I believe. Just one moment. Okay. Please try and start again. Thank you. Um, 
This issue of humanitarian law is politicized by Azerbaijan. I will post a link in the conversation chat and show a video where the president of Azerbaijan and Turkey were talking about Armenian prisoners of war as a subject of trade, planning to return them in exchange for maps of the mined areas in Nagorno-Karabakh. This is undeniable evidence that Azerbaijan is engaged in human trafficking and the Armenian prisoners of war are the subject of political bargaining for Azerbaijan. They are being illegally held for exchange of mine maps. Therefore, all the trials against the Armenian prisoners of war are fake processes. The, their purpose is to draw dust in your eyes. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that since May 12, the Azerbaijani troops have violated the territorial integrity of Armenia. They are in our sovereign territory illegally until today. We call on our European partners to impose sanctions on Azerbaijan for violating Article 2 of the United Charter. I will say then want to repeat it again that such gross violations of international law by Azerbaijan should be cause of concern not only for Armenia, but also for the entire international community. Because Azerbaijan's behavior and confidence in impunity are a threat for international legal system, for not only regional, but also world security and peace. Dear colleagues, Azerbaijan must leave the sovereign territory of Armenia and return all illegally held prisoners of war. You have a significant role in this issue because with joint effort, we can protect international legal order and reach security and peace in the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I will then pass the floor to Siv Motlet from Norway to be followed by Pia Kalma from Finland, please. Ms. Motlet, please. Do we have Ms. Motlet? Yes, sir. In that case, I, yes. I will pass the floor to uh, Pia Kalma, please, to be followed by Marilene Gill from Canada. Ms. Kalma, please. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Pre Mrs. President, uh, Mr. President, <laughs> dear colleagues, let me start by congratulating the rapporteur, Kari Henriksen, for her comprehensive, timely, and very relevant report. During the last year, the OSCE region has been under a lot of pressure by multiple challenges. The Nagorno-Karabakh situation escalated into a full-blown conflict, and the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to affect our lives in so many ways. We have also witnessed a sharp rise in violent extremism and terrorism, and the space of the civil society has continued to shrink. All these events and developments have had a weakening effect on democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. At the same time, geopolitical tensions and instability have increased. The pandemic has exposed structural cracks in our welfare societies, and it, it has affected those already vulnerable at the most. I am particularly worried about the tens of millions of children who have been robbed of their future by sinking deeper into poverty. Families have struggled to cope with uh, restrictions and lockdown measures. For many, the burden has been too heavy to bear and we have seen a sharp rise in domestic violent cases and an increase in mental health problems. Coupled with weak healthcare systems, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a pandemic of inequality, unfortunately. Instead of reaching out, the states have become more inward looking in the face of the pandemic. Some governments have used the pandemic to weaken fundamental rights and freedoms concentrating power to governments and tying the hands of parliaments is never a good development. Global challenges and crises require global solutions. There is no national cure to the health crisis, the climate crisis, the migratory crisis or international terrorism. The only way out is international cooperation, collaboration and solidarity, because no one is safe before all of us are safe. 
Instead of creating dividing lines, we need dialogue where we take the time to listen and to be listened to. We should base this dialogue on our common shared values and never step back from them. Dear Mr. Chair, signed almost 50 years ago, the Helsinki Final Act is still valid today. Our shared values are excellent building blocks for multilateral cooperation. We all benefit from a successful multilateral system and it should be strengthened. We must focus on the early warning signs and prevent conflicts instead of allowing them to escalate. We must work harder to show concrete results of our work, especially for those who are in doubt. More dialogue, more constructive debate and more efforts on building trust. I think, Mr. Chair and uh, Rapporteur, these are the tools that we need to tackle to our common challenges. Thank you very much. I will then pass the floor to uh, Marie-Lene Gill from Canada to be followed by Vadim Khalaychuk from Ukraine. Uh, Marie-Lene Gill, please. Uh, okay, we seem to be missing Marie-Lene Gill. Uh, then Vadim Khalaychuk from Ukraine, please. Oh. Okay, we'll move on. Um, I believe then Claudia Friedel from Switzerland, please. Uh, you're still muted, please. Uh, please unmute. Sorry. Thank you. Sehr geehrter Präsident, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Zunächst möchte ich Frau Henriksen herzlich für ihren ausgezeichneten Bericht gratulieren. Frau Henriksen zitiert in ihrem Bericht aus den allgemeinen Erklärungen der Menschenrechte. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family. Eine Formel, die der Welt Frieden und Sicherheit bringen könnte. Wir wissen alle, Die Realität ist eine andere. Schauen wir uns an, wie die Covid-19-Pandemie die Situation der Frauen beeinflusst hat. Konkret möchte ich Ihre Aufmerksamkeit auf den massiven Anstieg der Menschenrechtsverletzungen in Form von Gewalt gegen Frauen lenken. Wir wissen, dass jede dritte Frau auf der Welt körperlicher oder sexueller Gewalt ausgesetzt ist. Seit dem Ausbruch der Covid-19-Pandemie zeigen Daten und Berichte, dass alle Arten von Gewalt gegen Frauen und Mädchen, insbesondere häusliche Gewalt, zugenommen haben. Die Situation ist so alarmierend geworden, dass UN Women Gewalt gegen Frauen und Mädchen im Zusammenhang mit der Gesundheitskrise als Schattenpandemie oder Parallelpandemie bezeichnet. Wie Sie mir sicher zusichern, ist der aktuelle Kontext nicht der richtige Zeitpunkt, um unsere Wachsamkeit gegenüber Gewalt gegen Frauen und Mädchen zu verringern. In diesem Zusammenhang ist der Austritt der Türkei aus der Istanbul Convention gegen Gewalt an Frauen, das muss einfach betont werden, zutiefst besorgniserregend. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, Es liegt an uns als Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier aus den OSZE-Teilnehmerländern, unser Möglichstes zu tun, um die beachtlichen multilateralen Anstrengungen zu bewahren, die bisher zur Bekämpfung von Gewalt gegen Frauen unternommen wurden. Darüber hinaus müssen wir die Länder, die dies noch nicht getan haben, auffordern, dies zu tun, entsprechend und den entsprechenden internationalen Instrumenten beizutreten. Und wir müssen diejenigen, die jetzt sich daraus zurückziehen, sich auffordern, ihre Entscheidung zu überdenken. Und jede und jeder von uns muss als Gesetzgeberin die Anstrengungen gegen jegliche Gewalt gegen Frauen auf nationaler Ebene verstärken. Danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. 
Thank you very much. I will then pass the floor to Steve Cohen from the United States to be followed by Siv Moslet from Norway. Just connect Mr. Cohen, please. Okay, sorry. Then I'll pass the, ah, there we go, Mr. Cohen. Good morning. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be with you again today. Uh, the OSCE and Helsinki have, have done so much to try to improve the uh, state of democracy and human rights in, this, in, our, in our jurisdiction. And uh, I will be joining you this year as the chair of the uh, uh, American group. Uh, seniority has its perks. Uh, and it's the most important time that I can imagine for us to be involved. For democracy is under attack everywhere, including in my backyard. And the truth is under attack everywhere, including in my backyard. And this is a time we must be resolute in standing up for democracy, for the truth. Because the problem is the folks that have power that are not in democratic countries where they have they act as autocracies, fear democracy because it's an example to their people of what should be and therefore a threat to their power. So it is absolutely necessary that we remain vigilant and do all we can. We see what's happened, to, what's happened in Russia. Um, I fear for Mr. Navalny's life. Certainly his freedom has been taken from him. And I see other spots in Europe and around the globe, but also in our country. I never thought I would see it. I never thought I would see it. That's uh, unfathomable, but I will stand with you in all cases to try to uh, see to it that we, uh, support democracy and support transparency and support uh, freedom of the press and human rights. Uh, the uh, uh, situation is, is just, it's, it's, it's crushing to me because that's been what I've been about my entire life. It's why my great grandparents left Lithuania, left Russia, left Poland. It was for freedom and for democracy and for a fair opportunity to participate in their government and, and for freedom. So with all with those remarks, I just look forward to working with you this year and uh, know that the pandemic has been awful, but we've survived it. And, and part of the problem with that has been, again, in our country, we had a president that didn't to try to survive it in, in certain ways. He wanted to survive it himself. And he did with the best of medical care innovative medical care, but he didn't extend that to the people. He got a, knock, he got a shot, but a vaccination, but he didn't do it in front of the people. And I had polio as a child, and I know what it's like not to have a vaccination because of the conditions it causes later on. We need to make sure all of our people are safe. So I, I look forward to working with you in all these areas and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, I understand that uh, Ms. Moslet is having a little bit of uh, connection difficulty, so I'll go to... Uh, oh, it's okay now. Ah, thank you. Please go ahead. Chair, I would like to thank uh, Rapporteur Kari Hendrickson for this important report. It's essential that we keep up the parliamentary dialogue about the human dimension challenges in the OSCE region. I'm grateful that we are able to have a committee meeting and an annual session this year. I will be in Vienna next week and I look forward to meeting many of you uh, face to face again. Let me thank uh, the committee for uh, its active and relevant work over the past year, including the webinars about health as uh, uh, human rights and about the humanitarian situation in the conflict zones, I would like uh, to make three points. One, I agree with the statement in the report that in light of the pan pandemic uh, cooperation and joint uh, responses are needed more than ever. 
I also believe that the parliamentary oversight have been key during the crisis. Two, the media plays a vital role in every democracy. Protecting journalists and the work they do, it's key. I am worried about the trends referred to the report about the less access to public information and the increased attacks on journalists. I also support the concrete recommendation in the report. For instance, the proposal to make guidelines on social media is very relevant and should be followed up. Thank you, Cher, and uh, I uh, talk to you all uh, from uh, my campaign in the north of Norway. Thank you very much. Uh, I will then pass the floor to Ulvia Agayeva from Azerbaijan to be followed by Ivan Mamaiko from Belarus. Ms. Agayeva, please. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to see you all here and hopefully we will have the opportunity to see each other soon without any screens between us. I'd like also to thank Ms. Kari Henriksen for such a comprehensive and informative report. As we have touched upon such important topics, I'd like to draw your attention to the recent developments happening in Kalbajar city of Azerbaijan. Most of you probably have seen in the media that a few weeks ago, a long uh, a landmine explosion has killed two Azerbaijan journalists and a local official in the Kalbaja region of Azerbaijan. Four others were injured in the incident. One week before this mine explosion, a reconnaissance and sabotage group of the armed forces of Armenia attempted to cross into the territory of Azerbaijan's Kalbaja region at the Armenian Azerbaijan border to plant mines in the liberated lands. Azerbaijan's lands have been mined heavily during their nearly 30 year long occupation by Armenia since the early 90s. Those mines are planted everywhere in civilian infrastructure, canals, road jun uh, junctions, rural and urban passes, courtyard entrances, cemeteries and river banks in order to prevent the return to normal life. We constantly hear from the Armenian side alleged and uh, inflammatory allegations accusing Azerbaijan of detaining alleged Armenian prisoners of war. Let me clarify it once again for my colleagues. In accordance with the Article 8 of the 10th November trilateral statement, all Armenian prisoners of war have been returned to Armenia. I'd like to underline once more that members of the sabotage group sent to Azerbaijan for terrorist purposes a month after the trilateral statement signed by the Armenian government cannot be considered prisoners of war. However, the question arises, how many members of the Armenian diversion intelligence groups Cross the Armenian Azerbaijan border in an attempt to infiltrate Azerbaijan since November? And why? Well, I can answer to the question. The goal is to keep a series of terrorist attacks against Azerbaijan and military servicemen and civilians. Unfortunately, the inadequate reaction of the international community to Armenia's arbitrariness and atrocities encourage this country to continue to commit law violations. Armenia's refusal to hand over the min minefield maps and uh, intention of sabotage is a violation of all existing international norms and endangers the lives of many people, including journalists. Just to sum up, once again, I want to stress that our country continues to adhere to the full implementation of humanitarian measures as envisaged by provisions of international humanitarian law and the 10th November trilateral statement. We urge Armenian side also to demonstrate similar approach and fulfill its obligations. Due to these criminal actions, civilians and media representatives lost their lives. We demand Armenia to reveal the maps of the mines planted in the territories of Azerbaijan in order to avoid further civilian casualties. 
I'm sure it would definitely contribute to the establishment of justice, security, stability, and of course, long lasting peace in the region. Thank you for attention. Thank you. I will then pass the floor to Ivan Mamaiko from Belarus to be followed by Ahmad Arslan from Turkey. Mr. Mamaiko, are you available? No, in that case, I pass. Господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, добрый день. Прежде всего, хотелось бы поблагодарить за предоставленную возможность участия в дистанционной сессии парламентской ассамблеи. В докладе уважаемой госпожи Кари Хенриксон был затронут ряд вопросов, касающихся ситуации в Беларуси. Действительно, в настоящее время Беларусь переживает сложный политический период, связанный с защитой внутреннего порядка и суверенитета. Мы стремимся обеспечить дальнейшее поступательное мирное развитие. Акции протеста, наиболее массовые из которых в прошлом году происходили главным образом в Минске, практически прекратились. Ситуация стабилизировалась. Даже оппозиция признает, что потеряла улицы. Однако оппоненты, базирующиеся за рубежом, продолжают призывать к внешнему давлению на Беларусь, которое должно привести к новому витку дестабилизации. Белорусские правоохранительные органы получили весомые доказательства прямого иностранного вмешательства в президентские выборы 2020 года и связанные с ними акции протеста. Имеющаяся информация вновь и вновь подтверждает, что беспорядки в Минске и других городах были далеко не всегда спонтанными, а в ряде случаев целенаправленно подогревались из-за рубежа. Некоторые европейские страны в настоящее время выделили миллионы евро радикальной белорусской оппозиции, в том числе тем, кто, находясь за рубежом, призывает к санкциям и ограничениям против нашей страны. В этих условиях власти Беларуси попросту вынуждены идти на часто неоднозначно воспринимаемые шаги по поддержанию в стране социально-экономической и внутриполитической стабильности. Убеждены, если бы другие страны столкнулись с подобной ситуацией, последовала бы столь же решительная, если не более жесткая реакция национальных властей и правоохранительных органов. Усилия отдельных стран по нагнетанию напряженности вокруг Беларуси, в том числе с использованием инструментов ОБСЕ и других международных организаций, а также введение ограничительных мер и экономических санкций, авиаблокады, сворачивание политических контактов, открытая поддержка лиц, причастных к организации массовых беспорядков, расцениваются нами как попытка вмешательства во внутренние дела суверенного государства. Все это может привести к созданию очередного очага напряженности в регионе. Такие действия противоречат международному праву и базовым принципам ОБСЕ. Обращаем внимание уважаемых коллег, что распространение информации и формирование общественного мнения о ситуации в Беларуси требует повышенного чувства ответственности. Важно избегать поверхностных, поверхностных суждений. Хочу подчеркнуть, что введенные санкции в глазах белорусов подрывают имидж наших западных соседей, показывают пропасть между красивой правозащитной риторикой и реальными действиями, наносящими ущерб государству и людям. Запад постоянно призывает белорусские власти к участию в инклюзивном национальном диалоге. Однако намеренно игнорируется ведущийся в стране национальный диалог по конституционной реформе, в рамках которого идут дискуссии и вырабатываются решения о стратегических направлениях дальнейшего развития государства. В этом диалоге участвуют и представители оппозиции, если они конструктивно настроены и не призывают к санкциям против нашей страны. Напомню, что в начале следующего года проект изменений в Конституцию будет нанесен вынесен на общенациональный референдум. В заключение подчеркну, мы продолжаем неукоснительно следовать нашим международным обязательствам и нацелены на поддержание добрососедских отношений со всеми странами. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Ahmed Arslan from Turkey to be followed by Vadim Khalaychuk from Ukraine. Mr. Arslan, please. Distinguished colleagues, dear participants, firstly, I'd like to extend my acknowledgments and appreciation to Robert, uh, Mrs. Kerry Harrison for the comprehensive report. COVID-19 pandemic represents a critical moment in the human history, in addition to the loss of lives. This pandemic has been a test in every field of human activity, from politics to economy, to sociology and health. As it was mentioned in the report of Ms. Henriksen in our world during the COVID-19 
pandemic, conflicts, xenophobia, intolerance and racism have scaled up on our globe through online platforms. And this pandemic has once again shown us the importance of coordinating the action of the countries in cooperation and solidarity. I'm confident that we will come out of such crisis stronger through dialogue and cooperation at joint platforms with COVID-19 pandemic, migrants, refugees, and the displaced have become vulnerable, particularly against the health-related risks. Turkey, hosting about 4 million citizens as guests for about 10 years, and extending a helping hand to over 5 million people who try to hold on to life under challenging conditions just across the border, strived to fulfill its responsibilities even during the pandemic and ensures that the refugees benefit from the healthcare services in the same way as our citizens. COVID-19 also revealed inequalities in the field of healthcare and free healthcare services should be on the agenda. And many countries, in fact, have already started issuing COVID passes to facilitate travels and restoration of pre-pandemic conditions. And it is necessary to have certain analysis in this regard. I would like to answer to certain remarks in the international platform for protection and enhancement of women rights. Turkey has uh, always supported the legal attempts and uh, practices. And with this understanding, Turkey became a party to Istanbul Convention. Uh, however, since the effective date of the convention in Turkey and in many other parts of Europe, that it has been the topic of debate. So the UK and six EU states did not approve the convention. Poland being a member of the convention is still discussing the withdrawal from the convention. And as a result of the evaluations, we decided to withdraw from the convention. But this decision is not a, a step back from violence against, uh, from struggling against violence against women. And we have no tolerance against what is against women and also we reject the uh, accusations from armenian turkey has its vision and constructive messages regarding the region it has mentioned those messages many times but unfortunately this discourse is not welcome by everyone in south caucasus sustainable peace stability and welfare can only be possible through regional commitment and cooperation this is for sure and regarding sovereignty and uh, Territory of Azerbaijan, there should be respect from Armenia and uh, the land mines that are put in the uh, occupied Azerbaijan uh, should no more be harming lives, they should be cleaned. And Turkey will continue supporting Azerbaijan in this regard, as we have always on the line. Building trust uh, can only happen bilaterally. These mine areas should be clarified so as the topic so rather than accusing turkey armenia should fulfill its obligations that would be very relevant i'd like to thank you for your attention thank you i will then pass the floor to vadim khalaychuk from ukraine to be followed by marilyn gil from the ukraine is in the video room uh Halaychuk. Greetings. Is the chairperson, distinguished some, colleagues? Uh, we see, uh, just a moment, please. We seem to have some interruption. Just clarify. From the. Ah, okay. All good now? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, distinguished colleagues, against the breadth, uh, backdrop of ongoing systemic violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine, we deem it important to update the Parliamentary Assembly on the human rights situation on the ground. What we continue to witness over the last seven years of the Russian-occupied Crimea is clear sign that 
Impunity of perpetrator, the Russian occupying power for the committed crimes generates new wide scale violations. This unacceptable situation requires a common action as organization which places respect for human rights at the core of its comprehensive security. Until we succeed to do so, the residents of Crimea will continue to face persecutions, tortures, enforced disappearance, legal detentions, mass scale discrimination, forced imposition of Russian citizenship and conscription campaigns, as well as other violations of basic human rights and freedoms. Let me provide you with some facts and numbers. Since 2014, 50,000 Ukrainian citizens have been forced to flee Crimea, while half a million Russian citizens illegally moved into it. This has drastically changed the demographic map of the Crimean Peninsula. The majlis of Crimean Tatar people remains banned since 2016, contrary to Russia's international obligations and the order of the International Court of Justice. Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars face systemic discrimination in Crimea, which amounts to racial discrimination. There is targeted policy of forcing the Orthodox Church of Ukraine out of Crimea. Russian occupation, occupation administration suppresses any sign of independent media and cleans the Crimean information landscape of free expression. Crimean Tatar civic journalists suffer from prosecution, illegal detention, and intimidation. In clear violation of the international humanitarian law, 28,000 Crimean residents were forcefully conscripted into the Russian army with criminal persecution for those who refuse. Well, while children are indoctrinated into militaristic education programs, 44 Ukrainian citizens disappeared. More than 100 political prisoners remain illegally detained under politically motivated charges, most of them Crimean Tatars, persecuted by the occupiers for expressing discontent with the occupation. The number of children receiving education in Ukraine decreased by 54 times to only 0.2%, while Crimean Tatar language is 3.1%. And there's no school with Crimean Tatar language of instruction. Natural and cultural heritage of the peninsula is being destroyed. For instance, the conservation status of 40 objects of nature reserve fund was illegally downgraded. These destructive policies by the occupation regime must be stopped. We urge the Russian side to hear and clear the loud voice of the international community expressed in numerous documents regularly adopted by international bodies, including the OCEPA resolutions, and to stop violating the international law. We continue to count upon the principal position of participating states on non-recognition of Russia's claims on Crimea, including through restrictive measures, keeping Crimea high on the agenda. In this vein, let me draw your attention to the Ukrainian initiative, Crimean platform, a consultation and coordination mechanism aimed at consolidating the efficiency of international efforts with regards to the temporary occupation of Crimea. Its inaugural summit is planned to take place on 23rd August this year, on the eve of the 30th anniversary of Ukrainian independence. Thank you. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Marilene Gill from Canada to be followed by Francisco Javier Aragon from Spain. Marilene Gill, please. Not available. In which case, Francisco Javier Aragon from Spain, are you available? Buenas tardes. Presidente, estimados colegas, eh, en primer lugar quiero lógicamente agradecer a la, a la relatora su informe. Eh, desde España, desde nuestro país, que, como digo, queremos dar en primer lugar las gracias a todos los países miembros de este organismo por su excelente trabajo y su excelso trabajo durante la pandemia. No han sido tiempos fáciles para nadie, por ello nuestra gratitud a todos y a todas y nuestras condolencias también para, para todos aquellos que hoy no están con nosotros. En segundo lugar, queremos también mostrar nuestro reconocimiento y satisfacción por la mediación, comprensión y solidaridad mostrada desde todos los organismos, tras los hechos acaecidos recientemente en la frontera de España, en las ciudades de Ceuta y Melilla. Se ha vuelto a demostrar lo necesaria que es la política y lo, y lo importante que es la buena seguridad y la cooperación entre países en hechos y acontecimientos de esta naturaleza. Por lo tanto, muchas gracias a todos y nuestros mejores deseos de democracia para todos los países que formamos parte de la OCE. 
En cuanto al informe que nos ha, tra nos ha trasladado la relatora, creo que desde España queremos y desde el Senado queremos hacer especial mención en seguir trabajando a través del diálogo y la concordia para mejorar los conflictos que aún permanecen eh, abiertos y, y, y en, eh, a nivel mundial y sobre todo en, no, en nuestro país y en Europa. Creemos también importante eh, lo que han dicho algunos colegas respecto de mejorar el nivel de, de transparencia, eh, la multilateralidad como forma ideal de solucionar los conflictos y también lo que han dicho algunos compañeros relacionados con la libertad de prensa respecto a los medios de comunicación y, como no, también eh, el hecho de que no debemos bajar la guardia, a pesar de que estemos en, en países con una democracia bastante asentada, pero creo que debemos estar vigilantes y muy pendientes de lo que ocurre en cada uno de nuestros países y en nuestro entorno europeo. Creo también importante, como se ha dicho aquí, destacar el papel de las mujeres como primera línea de acción en esta difícil pandemia que todos estamos viviendo y, por supuesto, en ese acceso universal que desde, desde nuestro país intentamos potenciar día a día mejorando la sanidad como es un elemento integrador y estructural de, del Estado y también otro, otra serie de políticas que nos parecen importantes como la educación, los servicios sociales, eh, la seguridad, etcétera, etcétera. Y por último, eh, creo que también estamos de acuerdo con algo que han dicho algunos colegas respecto de que hay que sumar nuestras propuestas y nuestras respuestas para intentar mejorar el, el futuro y sobre todo mejorar la seguridad, la democracia y los derechos humanos, que yo creo que es un poco el objetivo que, que a todos nos afecta en esta, en esta charla. Así que enhorabuena a todos por vuestro trabajo. Que sigamos trabajando en esa línea de concordia y de diálogo, como he dicho, y desde España os deseamos lo mejor para, para próximos eventos. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Maria Karapatian from Armenia, if available, to be followed by Kairat Kozamzorov from Kazakhstan. Ms. Karapatian, Thank please. Thank you, Andreas, dear Kiriakos, dear Kari, dear colleagues. It's good to see us all together again. I too will be talking about the dozens of Armenian prisoners of war that are still kept in Azerbaijan months after the end of the war that Azerbaijan launched on Nagorno-Karabakh last October. We in Armenia within a short period of time returned all Azerbaijani nationals in our custody to Azerbaijan. This is what international humanitarian law demands. This is also a commitment of the trilateral documents that put an end to the war. So there are no Azerbaijanis within Armenian custody today. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan has not returned home all Armenians captured during the war, is capturing even more people following the end of the war and is now putting them through a bogus court trial in Baku. Azerbaijan's president, or rather dictator Aliyev, is doing this for several reasons. Aliyev is not returning the Armenian detainees because he wants to prolong the suffering he has inflicted on the Armenian people throughout the war. It is his way of harassing the Armenian people of Nagorno-Karabakh, trying to tell them it is not safe for them to live in Nagorno-Karabakh. It is his way of implementing quote-unquote peaceful coexistence with the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. So basically he's offering slaughter and slavery. You will hear the regime in Azerbaijan talking to you in the name of peace in the South Caucasus, economic collaboration, transport routes and whatnot. In the meantime, Aliyev claims he's going to take over a piece of the Republic of Armenia as a sovereign corridor through the Republic of Armenia to connect to Turkey. This May, Aliyev invaded the territory of the Republic of Armenia in an attempt to implement this plan and still hasn't left our territory. Armenia is of course ready to open roads and rails in return for roads and rails. Armenia did not put any country under an economic blockade for that matter. Then why Aliyev wants a sovereign corridor? This also has rather authoritarian reasons. A mutual deblocking of roads and rails would mean interdependence and at least some guarantee for peace in our region. Meanwhile, a sovereign corridor serves perfectly for domestic consumption in Azerbaijan as part of Aliyev's heroic expansion. Dear colleagues, it is the moral, humanitarian and political duty of this parliamentary assembly to contain Aliyev's warmongering rhetoric and to call on Azerbaijan to return the Armenian detainees home not portion by portion, but everyone and immediately. 
and leave the territory of the Republic of Armenia. I want to acknowledge the efforts of the Russian mediation, the US mediation, and most recently also the support of the Republic of Georgia to this process of the return of prisoners of war to Armenia. Thank you. Thank you. I then call upon Mr. Kozam Zorov from Kazakhstan to be followed by Ms. Barbara Bartusz from Poland, please. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги, уважаемые дамы и господа. Хочу поблагодарить госпожу Керри Хендриксон за актуальный и очень содержательный доклад. Считаю, что вопросы соблюдения прав человека должны и дальше занимать важное место в повестке парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Права человека составляют приоритетное направление работы нашего президента Казахстана Хазмужа Марта Тухаева. Под руководством главы государства реализован два комплексных пакета демократических реформ. О них я говорил ранее в комитете в рамках зимнего заседания. Очередной этап реформ направлен на укрепление механизмов защиты прав человека. Так, депутатами нашего парламента инициирован проект закона о уполномоченном по правам человека в Республике Казахстан. Законопроект основан на парижских и венецианских принципах. В документе особое значение уделять статусу уполномочен по правам человека, порядку избрания и принципам его деятельности. Значительно расширяется полномочия, полномочия омбудсмена в части восстановления нарушенных прав граждан. Учрежден Национальный центр по правам человека, который выполняет функцию рабочего органа, уполномоченным по правам человека в регионах. Усилены меры поддержки лиц с ограниченными возможностями и детей оставшихся без попечительства родителей. Ужесточено наказание за насилие в отношении детей, за сексуальное насилие, педофилию, распространение наркотиков, за похищение человека и незаконное лишение свободы. Поставлена задача присоединиться к факультативному протоколу Конвенции о правах ребенка. В 2022 году планируется внедрить индекс благополучия детей а также завершить ратификацию факультативного протокола Конвенции о правах инвалидов. 9 июня текущего года глава государства подписал указ о дальнейших мерах в области прав человека. В их числе борьба с торговлей людьми, пытками и жестоким обращением, укрепление прав женщин и лиц с ограниченными возможностями. Благодарю вас за внимание. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Ms. Barbara Bartus from Poland to be followed by Yasmin Posio from Sweden, please. Ms. Bartus. Uh, you are muted. If you could please unmute yourself. I think we're still missing. Please go ahead. It sounds like. So let me again thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I want to thank very warmly our rapporteur, Mrs. Carrie Henriksen. Thank you for the huge load of work that has been invested in the preparation of this needed and uh, interesting report. Let me reiterate the comment uh, of our Deputy Chair Margaret Sederfeld. Indeed, the pandemic has uh, um, impacted all of us. The pandemic also uh, uh, limits various rights, uh, uh, like the enjoyment of a fundamental right to life and to health protection. We had problems with uh, saving human lives in very difficult situations all across our member states, participating states, but it has also limited our mobility and uh, the opportunities to meet uh, or to participate. So the situation in Belarus, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, in uh, Russia, where not only the situation of uh, uh, Mr. Navalny, but also interventions and interferences in Ukraine, uh, the 
this has all not been responded to uh, by our organization because of our infringements on mobility. So we could not interfere, we could have not interfered, um, intervened uh, effectively. And we see various situations where people standing up for freedom and democracy in Belarus are detained. Also, Polish minority in Belarus uh, suffers from many restrictions and we have lesser say. Nevertheless, we are very happy to see the report and uh, we uh, hear the need to uh, cooperate with autonomous uh, OSC uh, uh, institutions such as ODIR the Office for Democratic Institutions and hum Human Rights. In this context, I want to assure you that uh, the regular course of implementation meeting of human dimension, um, this should be re restituted as soon as possible because such implementation meetings are a very unique platform. Many NGOs attend on the par with participating states of uh, OSC. So the cancelling of the implementation meeting last uh, year was another example how COVID-19 pandemic impacted our situation. That's why our exiting from the pandemic should be also um, uh, should also imply that we will take uh, all measures available to us to uh, bring back the regularity of our meetings. Uh, I also um, appreciate all the comments on the situation of uh, children and uh, young people uh, because of pandemic. Being a woman myself, I think that we women maybe tend to be stronger unlike children and young people we should mobilize our efforts in order to support uh, the empowerment of children and young people using economic and educational measures uh, uh, also as for audio and uh, representative for media freedom, we should uh, try to look closer at the situation of social media because social media and their situation and their impact on the election processes will be important. Sorry for overstaying my time. Thank you for the report. It's crucially important. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. With that, I pass the floor to uh, Yasmin Posio from Sweden to be followed by Amina Agazade from Azerbaijan, please. Ms. Posio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate Madam Hen Carrie Henriksen for the report, which raises a lot of important issues that we deal with in the OSCE region. And also how the pandemic has increased the urgency for parliamentarians and governments to act in a manner that decreases the inequalities and discriminations we see in all of our countries, albeit to varying degree. These inequalities exist between developed and undeveloped countries, within countries, and between women and men. But I must say that it is unfortunate that the rights of LGBTI persons and organizations are not mentioned at all in this report. As a politician, of course, I would love to talk about all these inequalities, but there is a time limit, so I will focus on the ones that hits half of the population, regardless of income or position. Women still don't have half of the seats in parliaments or governments. Women still have lower income and are still victims of domestic violence. And in some countries, men's violence against women aren't considered as an equally severe offense as men's violence against other men. Even though uh, conventions such as Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence on its own does not solve that problem, a parliament and government that ratifies such a convention sends a signal to the society that this issue is taken seriously. That is step one towards ending the inequalities we as women face in our daily lives. 
Sexual and reproductive health and rights are crucial to eman emancipate women. If we cannot decide of our own bodies, if we cannot have safe pregnancies or abortions, if we cannot decide on how and when we want to have sex, we will not be able to take part in and contribute to the society in equal terms. We also need to change toxic gender norms, and that has to start at an early age. That is why sex education is so important. That does not only include how a child is made, but also gender norms, the importance of consent, and how one can protect oneself from pregnancies and diseases. There is so much more that can be done to end the unworthy and appalling injustices against women. What I have mentioned are essential tools towards an equal society. And let me end by saying that I look forward to an OSCE region where all human rights are respected. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will then pass the floor to Amina Agazada from Azerbaijan to be followed by Serene Mobanya from France, please. Ms. Agazada, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Carrie for the presentation. Uh, for the presentation, she mentioned the conflict on the OEC territory, and I would like to draw attention to the ongoing. Uh, first, it's not up to the Armenian side to comment on the visit of the leaders of neighboring countries. The country cannot occupy its territories, but rather liberate them. It was indeed as a result of the 44-day war that Azerbaijan liberated its lands from occupation and ensured its territorial integrity. We recommended the Armenian side to get closely familiarized with the joint statement signed by the leaders of the three countries, including their own, and take necessary steps to implement these statements. Armenia should act leaning on the real situation rather than on illusions. And also I want to focus your attention on following. All cultural and religious monuments in the territory of Azerbaijan belong to cultural heritage of the Azerbaijani state and people. Armenia has pursued systematic policy to destroy, pillage, and misappropriate Azerbaijan's cultures heritage, both in the territories it has occupied for 30 years and in Armenia per se. By destroying the monuments, changing architectural features, and conducting archaeological excavation, Armenia pursued far-reaching targets of removing any sign heralding their Azerbaijani origins. Mosques and their religious sites, cemeteries, archaeological sites, as well as museums, libraries, and other cultural objects have all been either totally destroyed or plundered. Mosques have been vandalized and turned into pigsties. Out of 67 mosques, 64 have been raised to the ground or seriously damaged. Many authentic Azerbaijan cultural objects have been subject to brutal interference with a view to changing their character. And all this action constitutes a gross violation of international humanitarian law, including UNESCO instruments such as the Hague Convention of 1954 for protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict and its two protocols. Armenia has consistently prevented the UNESCO and other specialized international institutions from visiting uh, the occupied territories of Azerbaijan and evaluate the state of cultural heritage therein. Azerbaijan's numerous appeals to UNESCO and other similar organizations to that and have remained unimplemented. Uh, this is turn played a role in nurturing sense of impunity of Armenia left Azerbaijani cultural heritage without protection in the face of Armenia's systematic acts of vandalism and those inflicted serious damage upon it. Azerbaijan at the highest level declarates its determination that all cultural and religious monuments in the liberated territories, irrespective of their origin, will be duly preserved, restored, and put into operation. Our strong track record in promoting multiculturalism, both at home and abroad, is a guarantee 
uh, to this regard. And also Azerbaijan is ready to work with relevant international partners, including UN agencies, as well as individual states, which are willing to contribute to peace and stability in the region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Ms. Serene Mobagne from France to be followed by Meridou McFeedron from Canada. Ms. Mobagne, please. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur le Président, Madame la rapporteure et chers collègues. Je tenais tout d'abord à féliciter notre rapporteur pour son très intéressant rapport placé sous le signe du renforcement du multilatéralisme. Je salue les recommandations qu'elle propose. Il est vrai que la crise du Covid-19 a bouleversé nos sociétés et le visage du monde en impactant nos vies et pas seulement au niveau sanitaire. Cette épidémie, comme vous le relevez si justement, cher Carrie, a modifié tous les pans de notre société, notamment économique, psychosocial, sanitaire, associatif, carcéral, scolaire et démocratique. Elle a creusé davantage les inégalités entre les populations et a frappé encore plus durement les personnes déjà en grande précarité ou isolées. Cette crise protéiforme a mis en lumière de nombreuses failles, tant régionales, nationales qu'internationales. Depuis le début de la pandémie, près de 4 millions de personnes sont mortes de la Covid-19. Et si nos gouvernements et nos parlements, les professionnels de santé, ont tenté au mieux d'endiguer la maladie, ils l'ont fait avec des moyens et des connaissances souvent insuffisants. La pandémie, qui, a, qui par essence ne connaît pas les frontières, nous a rappelé le besoin de faire face ensemble aux mesures, aux menaces d'envergure mondiale et la nécessité d'y apporter une réponse globale. Seule une réponse multilatérale est adaptée par son spectre d'action dans un souci de solidarité collective, d'équité, d'efficacité, de transparence et d'inclusion. Si nous ne pouvons pas empêcher de nouvelles pandémies, nous pouvons nous y préparer au mieux et tirer les conclusions de la manière dont nous avons géré la situation. Cela peut notamment passer par un traité international sur la prévention des pandémies et la préparation à celle-ci une meilleure prise en considération du « One Health » dans nos politiques publiques, un plus grand développement de fonds et de mécanismes du type COVAX destinés à venir en aide aux pays ne bénéficiant pas des traitements requis pour soigner une maladie ou s'en prémunir. Comme le disait notre collègue Eddie Fry, la santé doit être un droit universel. En tant qu'infirmière, J'en suis convaincue. Sur le plan démocratique, il nous appartient également de veiller à ce que, lors de nouvelles périodes de crise ou d'état d'urgence, les libertés soient proportionnellement, temporairement et strictement limitées, sous le contrôle des parlements, en portant une attention particulière aux populations vulnérables. Enfin, cette crise sanitaire à aggraver et occulter tous les autres sujets qui jusque-là occupaient nos débats, nos rapports, nos résolutions et nos points supplémentaires. Je vais conclure. Je ne compte pas les oublier, je n'oublie pas les méconnaissances des droits de l'homme, l'atteinte à l'état de droit et les discriminations quelles qu'elles soient. Donc, spasiba pacificamente, c'est añade a ella et Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. I then pass the floor to Mary Lou McFadron from Canada to be followed by Senator Tina, Tina Smith from the United States, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dear colleagues, thank you for your presentations. I very much look forward to continuing our discussion on these important topics. In my work as a lawyer, human rights activist, and more recently a senator in the Canadian Parliament, I have been an advocate for upholding democratic rights and freedoms. I share with my colleague Hetty Fry the conviction that at the core, health is a human right. And I also share the concerns of our excellent rapporteur Kerry and the emergency resolutions filed. I fear that the rise of authoritarian policies and leaders aided by this pandemic in the OSC region threatens fundamental freedoms and undermines the ability of our societies to flourish and to coexist peacefully. The growth of authoritarianism is leading to the rollback of democratic rights, crackdowns on journalists and politicians and citizen advocates, fear and division, which in turn lead to the rise in intolerance. As OSCE parliamentarians, let us unite with the common purpose of fighting intolerance. If we look at history, we know that racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and other forms of discrimination cause profound harm to people and societies. In Canada, discriminatory laws and policies against Indigenous peoples have had long-lasting harmful impacts. For example, forcible removal of Indigenous children as young as three years old by the state into residential schools run by churches was an education system in name only for almost 100 years. In 2008, the Canadian government implemented the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in order to document the truth raise awareness and promote reconciliation. As you likely know from international news, the genocidal horror of these schools has been further revealed recently by Indigenous leaders as archaeologists have found hundreds of unmarked graves, mostly of children, at former residential school sites. When I speak with today's Indigenous youth, I am reminded that they still face discrimination, but they are also a powerful force for change. Young people are often the most tolerant and loving members of our societies, and they are very effective advocates when empowered. For this reason, my bill in Canada's Parliament would amend the Canada Elections Act to lower the voting age to 16 years. Vote young, vote long. Evidence shows that when youth are engaged in the political process, they are more likely to be democratically engaged for the rest of their lives. To combat the rise of authoritarian policies and leaders in the OSC region, we must include young people. Please ask yourself, how can I engage youth to participate in the political process to strengthen the health and viability of our democracies? Thank you, merci, miigwech. Thank you, Senator McFadren. I then pass the floor to Tina Smith to be followed by Serhi Kharakmanin from Ukraine, please. Senator Smith. Well, good morning from Minnesota, everyone. I'm uh, Minnesota United States Senator Tina Smith, and it is a pleasure to join the Committee on Democracy, Human Rights, and Humanitarian Questions at my first assembly meeting. I would like to first thank Senators Cardin and Wicker for the opportunity to serve as part of the US delegation to the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. I also would like to take a moment to thank my colleague, Special Representative on Antisemitism, Racism and Intolerance, Senator Cardin for his urgent item, addressing the rise of hate and tolerance, violence and discrimination across the OSCE region. And I'm proud to join with him on this important matter. I want to thank Chairperson of the General Committee, Mr. Hodi Gianni, for your leadership and Rapporteur of the General Committee, Ms. Kerry Hendrickson, for your timely report on the need to tackle global crises in partnership. Significant health disparities have existed in the United States and throughout the OSCE region long before the COVID pandemic began. They include discriminatory diagnostics and institutional barriers to quality health care. And while there has been a global reckoning over racism and police brutality, the impact of systemic racism in the healthcare system is longstanding. COVID-19 is a glaring example of how black, brown, indigenous, and people of color are hit hardest by the social determinants of health. According to federal data in my country and in others, 
Racial and ethnic communities have been more likely to contract COVID and die because they lack access to healthcare. They are more likely to have lower wages and experience chronic poverty. And because the systemic racism against black, brown and indigenous people has led to generational impacts. This limits freedom, opportunities, health, and even takes lives. In this historic moment, colleagues, we need to root out institutional racism and address the challenges that it has presented to all of us. This includes helping people who lack medical care, safe places to call homes, jobs, adequate food, and more. OSCE member states must work together to introduce long-term and systemic solutions to prevent racial disparities in healthcare. So I look forward to working with all of you to help achieve health equity and to provide quality health care to all members of all of our societies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Smith. I then pass the floor to Mr. Rachmanin from Ukraine to be followed by Vilya Aleknaita Abramekian from uh, Lithuania, please. Mr. Rachmanin is not connected. In which case, I pass the floor to Vilya Aleknaid. Are you available, Vilya? Yes. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you. I hope to repeat it in Vienna. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to add a few words on Belarus. Uh, we are facing an unpredictable regime on the other side of our Lithuanian border. Uh, everybody knows that uh, thousands of people arrested, tortured, persecuted. Uh, the regime does not hesitate using even such means as landing a, a plane in order to arrest an opposition activist. Lithuania considers this, uh, it as a case of state-sponsored terrorism. In order to address the humanitarian problems caused by the situation in Belarus, uh, Lithuania reinforced its efforts in helping Belarus citizens affected by the regime. Uh, since September 2020, citizens of Belarus have been issued visas under simplified procedures. Around 17,000 visas were issued, around uh, 4,000 of them were humanitarian visas. About 200 persons applied for asylum in Lithuania. Uh, but as you know, since uh, December, Belarus closed its land borders with the European Union, and we see it uh, as an obvious attempt to shut uh, the humanitarian corridors. Uh, what is interesting that at the same time, Mr. Lukashenko openly threatened to allow illegal migrants and drugs to flood to Europe. And now we witness dramatically increased numbers of illegal migrants across the border. In the first week of June alone, the number of illegal migrants compares to the number for whole year of 2020 and 2019 together. Uh, while in 2020 countries of origin were mainly Russia and Belarus, in this year Iraqis constitute a majority, followed by Iran, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan. Uh, Migrant smugglers exploit uh, the flight directions from Iraq, from Turkey. Belarus authorities do not cooperate on operational level, quite in contrary. And there is only reason to believe that border guards uh, may be facilitating migrant smuggling. Uh, and what is the conclusion? Very simple. In the center of Europe, we have a criminal regime and dictatorship. And I'm asking authorities of Belarus to stop violence and to allow the people to come to free and fair democratic elections. This is the only way uh, for the future. And I think that, first of all, people of Belarus deserve it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Alec Knight. I then uh, give the floor to uh, Kamil Aydin from Turkey to be followed by Sheila Jackson Lee from the United States. Please, Mr. Aydin. Thank you, thank you. And I would like to wish good morning and good afternoon to all participants. And hi, Kriekos. Uh, yes, hello from Ankara, from a sunny day. And I also would like to congratulate Carrie Anders Henriksen, honestly, for a very well prepared uh, report. And uh, I would like to start my speech by making a general comment. We all, we all, we all know and, 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 and agree uh, that, of course, you know, democracy is the most convenient form of ruling so far, with particular references to human rights, rule of law, freedom of speech, etc. It is at the same time to act behave and speak in tune with democratic rules and procedures, which prohibits hate speech and abusive language. Within this regard, one of the earliest classical representatives of democracy expresses three basic pillars of providing a good rhetoric or figure of speech. One of which is logos, meaning knowledge. And the second one is the ethics that is cause and effect relationship. And the third one is pathos in the sense of examples, events, images, metaphors, etc. In order to be morally convincing and effective, of course. Bearing in mind these basic principles with particular reference to Karabakh conflict, I would like to emphasize that with regard to the report. The OCPA report on reinforcing multilateralism in times of global crisis talks about good progress with regard to the return of the IDPs in Karabakh. This is rather a one-sided and misleading statement. It is true that good progress has been made with regard to return of the ethnic Armenians displaced during the recent conflict, of course. However, some cannot be said, same cannot be said, sorry, same cannot be said for nearly 1 million Azerbaijanis who were forced to flee their homes during the 28 years of Armenian occupation. As far as they are concerned, the IDP crisis continued. They cannot safely go back to their homes in the liberated territories of Azerbaijan because of hundreds of thousands of mines laid by the Armenian forces. Armenia still refuses to share all the maps of the mines field with Azerbaijan, hampering the rehabilitation efforts and return of the Azerbaijanis IDPs. Therefore, Focusing on the IDPs with regard to the 44 days of conflict misses the larger humanitarian picture and the continuing predicament of Azerbaijan IDPs. And thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rep Rapporteur. Uh, I really congratulate your effort. Thank you. Thank you. I then pass the floor to Sheila Jackson Lee from the United States to be followed by Vice President Azai Guliev from Azerbaijan, please. Ms. Jackson Lee, are you available? It seems not. In that case, Vice President Guliev, are you with us, please? I see you there. Please, you have the floor, Mr. Guliev. Thank you very much, uh, dear Andres. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Carrie Herringson for her great efforts in drafting a comprehensive report. I would like to respond very shortly to the groundless acquisition raised by Armenian delegation, although my colleagues made some clarification, particularly when it comes to the so-called war prisoners. Uh, in addition, I want to add that, that the European Court of Human Rights adopted a decision in which rejected Armenians' request to immediately release 11 Armenian nationals currently detained in Azerbaijan. There were two attempts by Armenia to secure the release of detainees under Rule 39 of the Rules of the Court. Both were denied. Azerbaijan has rights and obligations under international law to investigate and detain and as appropriate prosecute individuals who are suspected of violating Azerbaijan and international law, including committing uh, heinous war crimes. The 
the European Court decision underscored these rights and thus did not recognize the groundless claims of Armenia. The second uh, issue uh, raised uh, by Armenian delegation about the border delimitation and demarcation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. As you know that after the withdrawal of the armed forces from of Armenia, uh, armed forces of Armenia from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, my country is resolute to establishing the border protection system in the liberated territories in accordance with the statement signed by Armenia and Azerbaijan on 10 November 2020. The border demarcation and the delimitation is a bilateral issue and it should be exclusively resolved through the established channels of communication between the border authorities of the countries. Azerbaijan believes that the measures to strengthen the border protection system are implemented exclusively within the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. It is carried out uh, on the basis of maps available from Soviet time to uh, each side, available to each side that define the border line between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We propose Armenia to set up a joint commission to start bilateral discussions on border delimitation and demarcation as established practice that we have in the uh, other countries. Azerbaijan expects Armenia's positive reaction instead of launching another campaign of baseless acquisitions against Azerbaijan that we observe now. Dear friends, informal talks between Aliyev and Erdogan unfortunately was misleaded and misrepresented by Armenian delegation. If you see the, the dialogue of Armenian version, you can easily uh, convinced that this dialogue unfortunately have been distorted by Armenian, uh, some propaganda machine in order to mislead the international audience. Dear colleagues, finally, uh, I'd like to also touch up on one issue. We all understand that anger and the slandering speech of Madame Karapetian against my president and victorious Supreme Commander in Chief, Mr. Aliyev, who managed to liberate our territories from Armenian occupation and put an end to the impunity of Armenian criminal authorities, which lasted for many years. I do not expect, of course, any admire to my president from Armenian delegation, but they must know that this such an irrelevant hostility doesn't bring any honors to their country and doesn't change consequences of Armenian heavy defeat on the battlefield. My recommendation to you is, dear Armenian colleagues, to prepare yourself, first of all, and your people for peaceful coexistence with your neighbors rather than continued dissemination, such false information and propaganda about your neighbors. Stop telling one sided narratives and biased stance concerning their realities on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guliev. And uh, I know that we've been joined by the vice chair of the committee, Mr. Michael Link. So I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Link, please. Thank you, uh, Andreas. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, yeah, Kyriakos, dear Kari, um, I would briefly like, um, as, as uh, your vice chair in this committee, I would briefly like to elaborate on a thing which had been quite difficult and really complicated during the pandemic, and that is electoral observation. I especially want to thank all of you who participated in electoral observation. Um, this is something which we fair foremost, of course, deal with also in the third committee, um, because we, um, um, as um, officers of this committee, we think it is very important to give more importance to the fact uh, that we need to do follow up, follow up after electoral observation. And um, for all of you who could not participate in electoral observation during the pandemic, please do whenever you can after the pandemic, because this is such an important, enormously important part of our activity. Um, and the visibility that, that parliamentarians give to this is really irreplaceable. It's so important because we have more and more fake observations out there. We have uh, internationally non-recognized bilateral invitations uh, of uh, all sorts of observers which are not legitimized by OSCE and that is something which we need to face because uh, let's remind it, we are in the OSC area, the only one who has an international legitimization by the OSCE chairperson. Um, and that needs to be underlined. All the other uh, observations uh, issued bilaterally by parliaments cannot 
um, be entitled to have the title of international election observer because they have no international mandate for it. OSCE has, uh, the Organization of American States has, sometimes United Nations do it or, or Council of Europe does it, and we in the OSCE, I think, have the broadest knowledge. So thanks to all of you who participated in that. Um, thanks to all of those who will participate. We really need you there. And I know that the, that, the, that that our, of course, that our, sorry, my phone is ringing. And I know that our secretary in Copenhagen is was doing a great job in making possible that uh, we did the missions we had to do also during the pandemic. And let me, because I had the honor to, to also be the best special coordinator in the USA, let me highlight, it is very positive that the US Helsinki Commission, our colleagues from the United States, already are engaging with us in a follow-up discussion. And that's exactly what we need. We need a follow-up process after the electoral observation, because otherwise the observation ends in, in, in nothing and we need to work on this follow-up process. Thank you very much for this and uh, hope to see many of you in future observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and just before I, I hand back to the rapporteur to, to respond, I just wanted, I know that there was a few people that we ended up skipping because of technical issues um, that were on the list. So if you if you have now connected, we'd be happy to do so to, to include. Uh, I understand uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, if you're available, um, you're welcome to, to intervene now. Okay, I don't think so. I think that then we'll, uh, we'll conclude the debate there. Uh, I think we, we've tried to, to get to everybody, in which case I, I hand the floor back to uh, the rapporteur, Ms. Henriksen, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very interesting debate. And I will not uh, try to summarize uh, the whole of it, but I will just give uh, back to you some of my reflections. We are parliamentarians and we are human beings living ordinary lives in our communities. And I think what you have shared with us today is reflections and experiences from daily life of people in our region. And that is why we have this organization to improve life of people in the region, to secure people in our region and to commit to our common values that every country has signed upon. And I think that gives me hope because what you have spoken of today is a hope in the organization. You have provided experiences, reflections, and said that this can OSEEPA help to solve. And I totally agree with you. OSEEPA is one of the most important organizations to solve such conflicts, such suppressions, and such hatred and racism that we see around us today. So I will just conclude by saying I thank you very much for your efforts and for your hope in the organization. The, this organization is the organization who can transform this hope into practical work so that we can enable the region more security, more safeness, and more humanitarian experiences and lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, I pass the floor back to the chair of the committee, please, uh, Mr. Hajiani. Thank you, dear Kari. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, colleagues, for this uh, excellent discussion that uh, then uh, brings us to the final point of our agenda. Any other business? Finally, I would then like to thank all participants in our meeting today. I remind all members that on Monday, the 5th of July, and Tuesday, of the 6th of July, we are conducting an election electronically. For the position of chair of the committee, two candidates have been put forward. One is Ms. Serene Mauborne, head of the French delegation, and the other candidate is myself. For the position of vice chair, only one candidate was put forward. 
that is, that is Mr. Michael Link. For the position of rapporteur, only one candidate was put forward. That is Mr. Johan Buzer, head of the Swedish delegation. I look forward to the formal declaration of election by acclamation of Mr. Ling and Mr. Buzer next week. Thank you for your continued service to our committee. Finally, I would like to once again express my warm thanks to Andreas for his professionalism and outstanding commitment through the years. I also wanted to express my gratitude to everyone else at the Secretariat for their cooperation and support. With that, I am pleased to declare our meeting closed. I look forward to seeing you all in person one of these days. Thank you very much.